Mary Ellen Parsley is a scientific and botanical illustrator, as well as an art educator. A former practicing architect, she has illustrated eight books and numerous articles for national and international journals. Her works have been included in the collections of the National Building Museum and the Library of Congress. She is a member of the Guild of Natural Science Illustrators, Maryland Federation of Art, the Art League at the Torpedo Factory, Washington Calligraphers Guild, and the Guild of Book Workers. We're very excited to have her with us today to teach us how to draw winter trees. And so with that, I'm gonna to toss it over to you, Mary Ellen. Thank you so much, Libby, and welcome to everyone. Welcome to my studio. And I'm looking forward to uh, giving you an introduction on how to draw winter trees. Um, trees are one of my favorite subjects. And uh, so we're gonna get started by, um, I'm gonna go through some, uh, some resources that might be helpful to you and then also our materials and then we're going to get right into drawing so uh, one thing that we do need is a little cup of water so while i'm going through our resources if you want to if you don't already have a little cup of water and you want to dash and get one this would be a good time to do that so I don't want you to panic at any point about taking lots of notes or doing anything like that because I have everything you need uh, on my website and so and I'm going to share that with you uh, right now and um, you're going to be able to see this in just a moment uh, and this is my website and Libby will be providing this uh, the link to my website in uh, the chat and if you scroll down under and if you go to the more section to botanical art workshops and if you scroll down you're going to find our drawing winter trees so you see an example of my artwork there our materials list we uh, I provided you with some photographs because sometimes you need a, a, a picture is worth a thousand words. I also have a handout here that you can download um, that will explain everything about tree and all the basics about artistic anatomy for trees for you. Uh, and then some recommended texts for your studio bookshelf as well as a master artist gallery here so you can see some wonderful examples by artists um, from the Renaissance all the way through the 19th century and early 20th century. Um, also, I have some photo images for you and then some examples of how to get started and then a little further elaboration for when you're feeling brave uh, if you want to work with trees and in ink or also, if you want to dive into not only drawing trees, but also using the trees to make black walnut ink and the, and the like. We won't be getting into that in any detail today, but one of the things that I like to remind my students is, is that once you've been a student of mine, you are a student for your student for life. So my email, Libby will make available in the chat as well. And I love to hear from you and I love to see examples of your artwork. So please feel free to contact me if you would like to share your work. Um, and also if you have any questions even in the future. So let's go ahead and get started with some of the references. So Looking at my desk, okay, I have uh, the I have books that I keep on my bookshelf. Uh, this book is by, and you can see, Well Thumbed: The Artistic Anatomy of Trees, its Structure and Treatment in Painting. This is by uh, Rex Vicat Cole. He was a British artist and art educator, and it is the pretty much the last word on artistic anatomy and trees. He covers everything, gives you lots of examples, covers everything from drawing the buds all the way to drawing the different, different kinds of trunks and how to group trees. So it's highly illustrated. And the best part is it's a Dover edition, which means it's quite inexpensive. As a matter of fact, all these books are Dover editions, so they're easily um, accessible and also they're inexpensive for your bookshelf. So um, there's that. Then the also the other two books that I especially folks who are first starting out I always recommend are two books by Arthur Guptill, 
uh, Guptil was an artist, educator, and an architect and, and illustrator. He was an all around, a very accomplished man uh, and lived again in the early half of the 20th century. And these how to books have, I, I find are essential on every artist's bookshelf. Um, they have wonderful examples in them and also are very, very clear and explanations for when you don't have a teacher there to help you. So those are for my artist bookshelf, and and uh, I find that most artists are often bibliophiles. So, so uh, so feel free to order those and enjoy those. Um, and now on to our materials. And as I mentioned, everything that I'm showing you right now is on my uh, is on my website. So you don't need to worry about taking copious notes. Uh, about that. You can just sit back and relax and get yourself set up. So um, what I uh, always have handy, uh, start out with the most basics, is I am very fond of just these handheld uh, pencil sharpeners. They're portable and uh, easy to uh, stick in your pocket. The other thing is, is what I delight in them is they make no noise. I'm unfond of uh, the grinding of pencil sharpeners. So these are very handy to have. The Pink Pearl Eraser. Now Pink Pearl is a, is a brand, um, and, uh, but it's basically your, your standard pink eraser. Uh, and this is wonderful for both eradicating as well as um, picking out highlights when you use it very gently. Another option is the is the gummy eraser, or also called the kneaded eraser, which comes as it looks like a when it comes out of the package, it looks like a piece of gray chewing gum. Uh, but these are these are very, very gentle erasers. They're not eradicators, so they won't take the line away completely, but they very, very gently can alter your values, and we'll talk about how to use those then. And they are also very, very handy at picking out tiny, tiny highlights because you can manipulate the shape of the eraser. What I also have here are some stumps. Okay, these are paper uh, these are just uh, rolls of paper, and um, that and I like to have a few handy. One tends to have a little bit darker graphite on it than the other, and so I have one for when I'm blending in a lighter area, and one for when I'm blending in a darker area. Uh, other things that I have are I have a 2H pencil as well as a 4B pencil. Now these are standard pencils. Uh, and standard drawing pencils. And you may wonder, what's the difference between a 2H and a 4B? Well, the wooden pencil, as we know it, was actually invented by uh, Henry David Thoreau of Walden fame. And uh, but what uh, he made graphite far, far more usable by blending it with a clay. So the 2H and the 4B indicate the clay to graphite ratio. Generally, the more clay you have, the lighter the line of the pencil for the same amount of pressure. So always remember H is hard. And if you remember that it's a hard pencil, then you'll remember that it's a lighter line. And then the B, I always remember is for bold, and that will give you a darker, softer line. Okay, so generally you use 2H pencils for underdrawing, for when you're just putting in the sort of construction of the line, of the uh, drawing, and then you use the Bs when you start to move into putting in a great deal of, of, um, of value or texture in the drawing. What I also have here too, uh, and because this is our featured media for today, is you'll see I have a series of different, and you'll notice that your that that your water soluble graphite pencils also have the indication of a B, and generally the higher the number, the softer it is, or the bolder it is. The and if it's an H, the higher the number the lighter it is, the harder it is. So even with the water-soluble graphite pencils, the, the, the numeral, the, the alphanumeric on code on the end of it works the same way. So 
So we have these pencils here um, and our water soluble graphite. Now, the one thing to remember about water soluble graphite is it works just like regular pencil. That's the beauty of it. Um, until you add water to it. That's the only difference with it. Um, so they, you can draw with them just like you would any other pencil and you could actually choose never to put any water on it uh, and it would be a, a, just a pencil drawing. Other things that are available to you just so you know in water soluble graphite is you can buy just, just as you can with regular graphite, you can buy it in, big, in large stick form and you can also buy it in, and I find this very handy for uh, doing backgrounds where it's a cake and this will allow you to, you know, dip a wet brush in and then put in very, very small, deep, um, uh, dark areas uh, if you want to have that handy. Um, and initially you might find this a little bit difficult to control. So I would say experiment with this first okay before you do that and I'm going to show you how we're going to use all of these tools you'll notice I have a variety of paint brushes generally for what we're doing with uh, with the with the uh, soluble graphite you're going to need uh, you're going to need smaller brushes anywhere from a one to a six and they will and generally rounds and so that's the round brush that comes to a gentle tip on the end there uh, I do keep some flats or brights handy so the flat brushes and this is for if I want to put in background in some area I just have these handy on the side so that puts us through with our media and Libby I'm going to ask really quickly we went through our references with the website um, the books and now our media do we have any questions before I get into doing a little bit of a demo we do. So there okay. are several questions about the types of pencils that you're using. There was a question if um, watercolor pencils could be used or if colored pencils were okay for the water pencil part of the course. Um, is that, or watercolor pencils, are, are those are those okay? Yeah, well, if, you have, uh, if you have watercolor pencils, that's perfectly fine. What I would recommend that you uh, get, uh, when you start drawing is is that you choose a color especially when we're working on the trunk of the tree that you choose a color that is close to the actual color of the trunk of the tree um, and, uh, and and when we start to put on the texture and the value but we get started with drawing with a two with the 2h pencil uh, just the the non-soluble 2h pencil uh, to do that. You'll also notice that, and I'll uh, go back to my camera here really quickly, you'll also notice that um, watercolor pencils will be a little, they, they will, they will not move, the, when you activate them with the water, they won't move as quickly as, uh, as the graphite. The graphite really, uh, it, it, the, the binder in the graphite dissolves very quickly and you'll find that you'll be able to move the graphite around a little bit faster than you will be able to with the colored pigment. Um, but once you get a little practice with it, it it'll be fine. So other questions? Yes. Uh, do you draw on the smooth or the felted side of the watercolor paper? Oh, now that's up to you. Um, now, uh, I tend to prefer, and um, so, and that's great. I have watercolor paper right here. I tend to use Arches paper. Um, I'm really fond of Arches uh, hot press paper. So I tend to, uh, but I use the, what they call the satin finish, which has a little bit of tooth to it. So for those of you who are new to watercolor, um, don't, I, uh, don't feel bad, okay? It is a little bit, there is some vocabulary and some language here. Watercolor comes in a variety of thickness, watercolor paper comes in a variety of thicknesses as, as well as um, different finishes on the surface. Now, you'll notice that most watercolor paper has on one size, side, it may be a little bit more sized and it has a smoother surface than the other side of it. It really depends on your preference on what you want on, on what you want to use. 
um, depend, and I make that decision often based on my subject. So if my subject is a tree that has a very, very um, textured bark, like say, like the like behind me, I have an example of the Japanese black pine. And when I have a tree like that, that has a very, very heavy bark, I tend to use the rougher side of the paper because that way my materials are working with my media. Now, if I was going to portray a tree that had a much smoother trunk to it, then I would use the paper, then I, I would use the side of the paper that's a little bit smoother. Uh, with it, when it comes with the art to the arches paper to the um, with the uh, satin grain, the hot press, I find that to be a nice middle of the road for me. Uh, so, and just quickly, so we can just go through this for the watercolor paper, for those who are new to watercolor, is um, you're gonna have a rough texture, a smooth texture in general, and then something called plate. Plate is a very, very smooth, it looks almost slick, the surface. Uh, and I would say if you're starting out in watercolor, I would avoid plate for now. And, uh, but um, experiment with the rough and the smooth. The difference uh, to, uh, between the two is not very difficult. It's how it's made. And um, so generally, it's like ironing a shirt. If it went through a hot, hot rollers when it was being made, so the paper had all of the a lot of the texture and the wrinkles ironed out of it and so it creates a much smoother texture so hot press is always going to be a smoother paper and then a and then rough goes through a cold press or they even call it cold press sometimes and that will give you a lot more texture now just so you can quickly see the difference between the two i'm gonna I'm, I'm going to grab this really quickly so you can see, since this is such a good question, this is a rougher texture and I'm going to go ahead and switch the camera down here so people can see the difference between a rough texture. You can kind of see that it has little hills and valleys there. You can sort of see it. It's not, it's not super clear, but yeah. Okay, and there's a smooth there's a smooth texture. So if I put them in contrast to each other and maybe get the light to rake on there, you can see the difference between the two. At yeah, least you I can see the difference. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So any other questions? Um, there was one asking if you recommended woodless graphite pencils, not color pencils. Oh, you could use woodless graphite pencils. Oh my goodness, if you're a, a saintly person who never drops their pencils. Uh, <laughs> I don't recommend the graphite, pe the woodless graphite too often just because if you drop them, they shatter like glass. And frankly, I'm far too clumsy to uh, to use uh, woodless graphite pencils, but they're beautiful. And if you, if, if you are more coordinated than me, feel free <laughs> to use them. <laughs> And uh, one last really quick question. What was the name of the little tin of color that you mentioned? Oh, this is, let me, let me switch back again. I'm getting good at this, Libby, this switching back and forth. Um, so, so, so this is basically, it's just, a, it's what they call watercolor graphite. Um, I, anything that I show you is, it comes in a variety of, um, it comes in a, in a variety of different brands. Um, anything that I show you is not necessarily a brand endorsement, um, but this comes in a variety of, of brands and it's just a, uh, a it, they call it watercolor graphite and it's in a, in a little cake form. So Great. I hope that helps. Thank you. And Mary Ellen, I'm just gonna uh, let you know, I'm gonna remind you later to, to reshare out the names of those resources you shared at the beginning, not now, but at the end of class. Of course, of course, I'm happy to. And if folks also feel that, um, you know, they really want, like they're a little bit overwhelmed with brands and things like that, if they email me, I do make some recommendations on my website. Like I said, these are things that work for me. They're not necessarily, they're not a brand endorsement. Um, they, they work for me. And if you email me, I'm, I'm happy to tell you like exactly what I use and why I use it. Um, so uh, it, 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 so 
that's available. <laughs> so let's go ahead and get started a little bit. Okay, so I'm gonna, I actually am gonna uh, switch back again to my, to my desk camera. And what I have here is I actually have just a piece of scrap watercolor paper. And I really recommend this, um, that you, that, uh, you could just uh, have something. I always have two pieces of watercolor paper with me. I have the one that I'm going to be working on, and then I have a scrap piece of the same, of the exact same paper, same brand. And this is so I can do a number of things. The first thing is, is before I get started, especially if I'm working with a media, with a, a brand or uh, a media that I'm not accustomed to working with, that it's kind of new to me, I love to have the opportunity to take my pencils, to make a little value scale. So I know what's my darkest dark and what is my, my lightest light that I can get. And then I love to see, you know, how does that blend with my finger? How does that blend with the stump? I just wanna know how it moves and how much energy it's gonna take me to do that. Now, when you are blending, I am not pressing down hard at all in order to get this value scale. I am just doing this really, really lightly. You want to work with your paper. You don't want to be burnishing it where you're pressing down very, very, and you could see even the difference in the posture of my hand when I'm working that way. And I'm going to bring my camera down just a little bit. And Libby, if I go off camera, you just let me know. And uh, do. That, okay, great. So that was so that was my 4B pencil. That's just a standard 4B pencil. And just to give you a sense of how the value scale is quite different, because the 2H pencil has a lot more clay than graphite. And so we get this much, much lighter value scale. So its darkest dark is not as dark as the 4B pencil. So this is our this is our 4B. And this is our 2H pencil. So you can see that, what, that this is going to be very, very handy for doing construction lines and things like that, that I don't want necessarily showing up in my, in my final drawing. And the 4B is going to be great for when I want to put in, I, I want to put in a lot of uh, texture and value and things like that. Now, so, and then just to give a sense of, so this is one of my water soluble graphite pencils. So this is a 6B, so it gets a really lovely, rich, rich dark with that. And it's a very smooth, you're gonna feel, and, and if you're experimenting, I hope you're experimenting along with me. Um, it's kind of fun to do this together. And so when you see this, you'll notice that a couple of things. When I'm creating value, I use a very consistent line. I'm using, and especially when I want to cover an entire area, I use a very consistent boring line like that. I'm using the side of the pencil rather than the point, rather than being down on the point of the pencil. Okay, so rather than holding it up like this, I'm holding it off down to the side like that so I get a broader, a broader area of the tip. And then in order to make it go, get darker, I'm layering rather than pressing. So it's much, much better to just use light, light layer, uh, you know, apply it gently and lightly and consistently in your line work as you go across and layer it rather than pressing down to get it as bold as you can uh, right from the start, okay? And I'm gonna put a little WS next to that because that's our water soluble one. So I'm gonna bring over my, uh, my water container over here. I'm gonna keep it on my scrap paper and not on my drawing. And I'm gonna grab uh, one of my brushes here. And one of the things I always have handy with me is a little piece of paper towel just to daub off any of the excess water, okay? And you'll notice that I dip and then do that on the edge of the, 
get it, just wipe it gently on the edge of the rim there. Maybe take a little bit off with that with that uh, uh, with the paper towel. If you have a brand new uh, if you have a brand new brush, you're going to notice that the brush is a little bit stiff. And if you're new to watercolor, that might be a bit confusing. So one of the things you need to keep in mind is that br watercolor brushes come with a bit of starch to keep the tip very, very nice. Only takes about two, three minutes, good swish in there. And you're going to notice that the bristles will become soft and flexible, and then they'll be ready to use. And no need to worry about changing out your water. Having that little bit of starch in the water is not going to affect the rest of your watercolor. The only time you need to worry about changing your watercolor water is when the color, uh, when the, there's so much pigment in there that you're noticing that it's beginning to make an effect on your on your paper and so that's when you want to make sure that you change your change your watercolor and you know and better to change it more often than than uh less so when i'm going to be Mary putting, Ellen, yes. i'm sorry to interrupt you what size brush are you using right now oh, this one right now this one is a four okay so it's between anything between one and six is fine okay and and so this one right now is a four and so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go in. I mean, isn't that beautiful? Look at that. Just love this medium. And it gets much darker. So it's good that we're experimenting with this because you can see right away that, you know, that value goes a little bit, goes a long, long way. Now, you're going to notice that we've got a little bit of pigment at the bottom here. Maybe we don't want that. So what you're going to do is remember that brushes work both ways. They, 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 put, they put the value down, but they also can act as sponges, and we can pick up some of that, some of that value with a drier brush and then blend blend that in like that and get a nice a much smoother value without that little bit that little tip at the end like that run right over that again work that way so with watercolor less is always more don't fuss with it too much okay and then let's do a little experiment now let's 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 get used to this medium i'm going to push this up and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my I'm going to take my uh, my two B. Okay, this is so whichever one you have is great. I want you to take the lowest number that you have of your watercolor pencils, and I want you to draw for yourself a little circle. Now, if you're thinking I I don't know how to draw a circle, sure you do. You can draw a straight line. Okay, so I'm going to draw this a little bit darker than I normally would. Okay, yeah, Mary Ellen, I don't know if you can get any closer in so we can see yeah. those, those lines since they're so faint. Thank you. Okay, so so I'm going to draw this a little darker than I normally would, and uh, and the so uh, so that you can see what I'm doing. So I'm going to basically draw one vertical line, then I'm going to draw a horizontal line. No. Without a ruler, when you draw, want to draw a straight line, keep the heel of your hand on the edge of your paper, extend your pencil, and then just gently move down the paper and you'll draw a straight line. Same thing goes for the bottom. Extend your pencil tip, run your heel of your hand across the edge of the paper, and now you have a straight line. So all without a pencil. There's a wonderful, story that I, I I want to believe is not apocryphal um, it's about Michelangelo that he uh, one time uh, wanted to show his drawing skill and he freehanded a perfect circle in front of the Pope. Um, I want to believe that's true. I can't do that, but I'm not Michelangelo. So, so, but it's a wonderful thing to think of. So now I'm going to decide how high I want my, or how, um, large I want my sphere to be. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that, just use my fingers, and I'm going to take exactly the same measurement and put it there. And now this is easy, right? We have four points. And all we have to do is connect them with 
four arcs. Now, I recommend your hand has some muscle memory. So do this one, do the top, do the bottom, do the top, do the bottom. Do it all the same. And then if you have to make any corrections, you can do so. So now you have a nice basic, a nice basic sphere. Now for our purposes today, because this is a little bit dark and I don't want to be dealing with it, um, when we get into working with our watercolor pencil, I'm going to erase those construction lines out. And so they're not in my, so they're not going to be interfering with my drawing. The next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to put just a little bit, we're going to imagine our sphere okay it has a bright light coming from this upper corner here so it's going to have a lighted side and a darker side and when we remember about spheres is this part over here is going to be our highlight so we're going to leave that alone with watercolor our brightest bright we just leave it alone we let the white of the paper come through this is our shadow side but right when the surface of the sphere turns away from the light, we get a little darker area. Remember, I'm using very boring lines here. I don't want to create any interesting lines because I want the viewer to look at my value and not at the line work. So I create a slightly darker area here to to create that shadow where the shadow darkens as it turns away from the light. But our ground surface always, 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 always reflects a little bit of light back onto our subject. So it gets a little bit lighter. It's kind of counterintuitive, but it gets a little bit lighter on the back side of the sphere there. And so that's our reflected light. So you can think about we have our highlighted side here. We have our turning shadow here. And we have a reflected light right, right there. And now I'm gonna add just a little bit, I'm gonna use my imagination. I'm gonna add a little bit of an elliptical shape here because Shadows are always elongated. And then I'm going to put in a cast shadow. This is the shadow that's on the ground plane. And I'm going to put a little bit of value in there. I'm drawing with my graphite pencil just like I would draw with any other pencil. And this is my cast shadow right there. And don't worry, if you're trying to take notes, you don't need to. It's on my website. So you'll be just fine. Just draw with me and enjoy yourself. Now, I have all of the values there I need with this pencil. Let's get, let's get our brushes out now. And we're going to start to just gently paint into those shadows. Just, just wonderful. And you can see we're going to get that nice turning shadow in there. Now, you'll notice I wiped my brush right there because what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pull just that little bit of that dark value in there. Okay. I'm going to come over here, soften down that edge because there, there is a little bit of shadow even on this side here just because it's turning away from the highlight. And then I'll add just a bit more water, and we're going to blend that out very, very gently, just like that. And what's really lovely about the water-soluble pencil is you can, you can leave a little bit of that line work in there for texture. Now, be a little careful here. You want to watch, look at the light, and I can see when I tip this a little. It's a very, very shiny here because I had lots of water there, but right here, it looks like it's dry, so I'm going to come in with the tip of my brush and I'm going to activate the graphite right there. 
and then I'm going to begin to just very, very gently paint that out. And any extra graphite, I'm going to push back into the dark, that darker edge of the shadow there. I'm just going to push that back in. And there you go. You just drew and painted your first shape in, uh, in water-soluble graphite. How much fun was that? Now, one of the things I want you to keep in mind is, is that when we draw, okay, the sphere, an egg, okay, so a basic egg shape, a cylinder, okay, we're going to just draw a quick cylinder here. That's an awful cylinder. I think I need to erase that. Got a, got a bad start on that one. I, so. Remember, when we're looking at shapes, so we've got a cylinder like this, okay? And then we've got cones, which basically just has that, that kind of wizard's hat type of thing. And when we want to think about how value works on all of these different shapes, I'm moving a little fast right now, but don't you worry, okay? You you do you, okay? I'm just showing you these as an example because these are going to be the only shapes that we really need to worry about when we're drawing trees. Occasionally, we'll have to worry about a cube or a rectangle. And you can just practice doing these nice it's kind of fun. It's a great doodle. I highly recommend that 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 you you doodle during meetings. I, I find, and I, I actually don't mean that in a funny way. That I, I'm trying to be funny. I I actually find I I listen better when I'm I'm doodling. Just don't give your boss my website or my email about that. <laughs> I'll deny it. I said, I guess I can't deny it. We're recording this. I can't deny it, right, Libby? So, and you notice I'm just picking up a little bit of graphite, putting a little bit of shadow there with some of those. And, and those are our basic shapes that we're going to need for our tree. So I'm going to pause for a moment. Libby, do you have any questions for me? Uh, there was a question about the weight of the watercolor paper you're using. Oh, okay. Yes, a great question. I tend to use 90-pound paper. Um, now, for those of you who are scratching your heads and being like, oh, no, watercolor again, I don't know what that means. So 90-pound paper is what 100 sheets of 20-inch by 30-inch paper weighs and it's a way of determining the thickness of the paper i find 90 pound to be a nice middle of the road paper um, so that's generally what i use okay um, you can go uh you can go higher uh if you you'll notice that for example for my watercolor pad here i'm going to turn it on its side there we go you're going to see that watercolor pads actually come with uh, the paper bound into it. And this is the little area where you can free your paper out, out of, and then you can see all of this is bound here. That's the, that's the area where there's no binder there. And that's to keep the paper stretched while you're working with it. So it doesn't buckle, doesn't get little hills and valleys through it. So um, now you'll notice that this one I didn't have attached or taped down or tacked or anything. And that's because we were working in such a small area. I didn't need to worry about it buckling. Um, but when you're working in larger areas, you do need to be concerned about that. Um, for our purposes today though, and especially with the water soluble graphite, I find that I find that uh, that our uh, it doesn't it doesn't matter nearly nearly as much. So um, I hope that whoops I hope that helps. So, any other questions? 
Um, someone did ask about Derwent graphic pencils. Are they water soluble? Uh, if if they if they are, it will say so. Uh, if it just says Derwent graphic on it, they probably are not. But there is no problem with so. And if you want to see the the difference between the two, so this this was I'll bring the camera back down again. Okay, so this was the water soluble graphite, and these are not water soluble. And you can see we don't get any of the we don't get any of the effect of the water soluble graphite. It's it just it just stays where it is. So you want to um, so you won't get this kind of wash effect with it um, if you add water to it, and that's how you'll that's how you'll be able to tell if if you if the labels rubbed off or something like that. So anything else? Nope, I think we're good. You can just jump on in. Okay. Now I chose for my model today, and this will end up on our on the website. Um, I chose for my model today to be um, this tree. This tree is a Chinese elm that's actually in the collection of the National uh, Bonsai Penjing uh, Museum, and uh, that's located in the National Arboretum in Washington D.C. and uh, so I'm actually a bonsai enthusiast, and uh, one of the reasons I chose this tree for our subject today is because it is um, because it's a, it's very compact, and it's a way of talking about larger trees. Um, in a smaller space. So because they have all of the same characteristics of large trees. So we're going to talk about how to approach your subject today. And then we're going to get into drawing this tree. So um, so this uh, so we're looking at our tree. We've got a beautiful winter tree. Our elm tree has lost all of its leaves. And uh, there's several things that I want you to um, take note of when we're looking at our subject here. Now, um, there's a big difference. We look at things all the time, but seeing is when we engage our minds. And as artists, it's really important that we get into the habit of seeing rather than just looking at the subject. So what I mean by that, um, and if, you, if you're interested in that subject, the sort of artistic seeing subject, one of the books that I highly recommend um, is uh, uh, it's uh, Frederick Frank's Zen of Seeing. And uh, he talks about uh, what we want to do is be fully present to the subject in front of us. And, and how we do that is, is when we just look at this, we say it's a little tree in a pot. When we look closer at it, we begin to notice the shape of the trunk. We begin to notice how it moves from the trunk to the branches to the tiniest of branches. We begin to notice that the pot is a beautiful, deep greenish blue, uh, and we begin to notice the texture of the bark. Now, when we first begin to think about a tree, one of the I, one of the things there's some things that we want to really, really break down, and I have a little overlay of tracing paper. So the very first things we want to think about is our overall height of our subject, okay? So if we're including the pot, that's from, and let me move out just a little bit more. So if we're including the pot, we're- Yeah, you can move out just a smidge bit more even beyond that. How's that? Brilliant, perfect, thank you. Thank you. So we have the bottom of the pot here and to the very tippy top of our, uh, of the branches, okay? Then we're going to think about the entire width of the tree, and that goes from the edge of this pot to the tip of the of the furthest branches over here. So you can see we have kind of it's it's close to a square, but it's just a little bit of a rectangle. And because our composition is a little taller than it is wider, that informs us as artists that we're going to orient our our paper in portrait, which means that our longest 
uh, our longest line is going to be the vertical axis, okay, rather than landscape where our longest line would be the horizontal axis. So if it's a little bit taller or if it's taller than it is wider, then you turn your page to be in the portrait position. Then what you want to pay attention to is you want to pay attention to the, the uh, angle of the trunk. This is absolutely critical. So you want to see how that major line of movement goes through the, uh, goes through the trunk there. The next thing you want to notice is, so the trunk begins, notice that the trunk has a, is very, very wide at the bottom here. And then as it moves up, it gets progressively more narrow. This is true throughout the tree. The branches are the widest at the trunk, and then they, as they break down they, uh, and divide, they go out into thinner and thinner and thinner branches. And the way I like to think of it is if I added up this width, okay, or if I added up this width with this width of these branches off to the side, I would get this width, the one that they broke off from. So that's what I look through. I do a little bit of visual arithmetic there when I'm looking at my tree and laying out my branches. I also look for the overall shape of the canopy. So you're going to notice we're going from big shapes, okay, to progressively smaller shapes. So I look for that big shape of the canopy. I notice I've got a nice kind of triangular shape there. And then I also look for how to balance, how the tree balances itself out because trees do balance themselves out. You'll notice that this branch balances out this branch over here and then so on. And that continues. We've got this one's a little lower, this one's a little higher, this one's a little lower, this one's a little higher, and it continues all the way up to that, uh, to that tree. Last but not least, and then we're going to get into drawing. Last but not least, I pay attention to voids. So this large void here and how it's almost like a, a it's almost like a mirror image, like it's flip-flopped with the void that's here. Now remember, we're dealing with a bonsai, so this tree has been in the care of another artist, and it's a, a, in the care of an artist who is shaping it and seeking to create these kinds of parallels and balance points uh, within the tree, because the tree itself is a work of art. So. That's why bonsai are wonderful subjects for this. So, uh, but even when you're dealing with natural trees, like the examples that I give you on the website, you're gonna see that trees do balance themselves out in this way because that kind of, that kind of asymmetrical balance is, is actually healthy for the tree and makes the tree grow stronger. So, so, and then we look for, as I said, these voids as well as the solids and then those big lines of movement. So, got our summary here. I've got my subject here. I'm gonna keep my subject handy. I'm gonna move, gonna give myself a little bit of elbow room here move some of my pencils a little off to the side so you can see everything that I'm drawing and I'm going to show you how I'm going to get started with my with with my drawing okay so now I drew ahead a little bit but I'm going to walk you through everything that I did to help you get started and I'm going to keep my subject right here so you have that as a reference so I'm going to I got started here on my on my drawing on my this is 90 pound arches uh hot press paper and what i'm what i got the very very first line i drew is i took my pencil and i went over here to the trunk of the tree okay and i brought that right over here and i saw that and i drew that line for myself 
that pencil line just like that. I've got that right there. So I have it in my mind. That Mary thread. Ellen, I'm yeah. sorry. I understand that you want to have the reference image next to you, but if it's possible at times to zoom into your actual painting or your drawing, oh, I definitely, the lines are so faint, it's hard to see them. Okay, I definitely, I definitely will. And I'll be darkening these up as I go along. So, so I will do that. Excellent. Thank you. So now that I have, I like to get my major thrust of the, the piece through. And I put that basically in the center of my page here. So I have that in the center of my page. The next thing I do is I, I like to use my fingers as my measuring tool. And so I'm making my trees slightly larger. Um, you also can use your pencil, okay? So I'm measuring the overall length of my subject here. Remember that's from the pot all the way to the tips of the branches here. And I'm gonna bring that over here. I'm just gonna make a little mark for myself on either side here. So I know, and I've within that, I have centered that thrust of that tree there. And I'm gonna, I'll darken these down just a bit so you can see those. Let me, oops. All right, there we go. All right, so you can see those marks. And I'm going to also measure the overall, okay, my overall height. So now I know from the bottom of my, from the bottom here, all the way up to the top of my branches there. So why do this? Okay, very, very important why we do this. The reason is, is now, and I'm gonna zoom out even further. This will be the last time I zoom out real, real far. Um, I do this because now I know my drawing that I put all of my time and effort into is not going to fall off the page, okay? I'm not gonna need to worry about, oh, I can't put this beautiful branch in because I didn't leave enough room. I know that everything now is going to be contained within that. Now I'm zooming back down so you can see. How's that, Libby? It, it's, it's okay. Yeah, I think that having the, the, the image next to it, I think it's drawing focus from your drawing itself. Okay. So it's possible not to, I, I, a lot of people can't actually see your reference image because the screen is kind of blurry. So okay. um, just seeing your drawing, I think will be helpful. And okay. Reasons, if that's possible. Okay. Sounds good. I will, I will do that. So now I've got myself oriented. I know these are my limits, top and bottom and side to side. So let's start with the getting our tree in. I will put in these basic lines that are the angles of my trunk. Bringing that in here, I notice that I have a little twist to my trunk there. I'm gonna come over and bring that in there. And I'm measuring as I go up. Um, I'm comparing and measuring as I go up. Now, we're working from a photograph today. Ideally, you would be working from life, and you would do the same kind of measuring. You would measure with your using your fingers, looking out, and I'm gonna switch my camera to me for a second, and at the risk of looking really, really silly, but I would be looking like this. I would measure with my fingers, measuring my subject, bringing it down to my page, measuring again with my subject, keeping my pencil at an angle, bringing it down to my subject, and that's how I would be working from life. So I'm gonna switch back to my, to my subject here, and that's how we would get that going along like that. Now the next thing that I would do, and we're moving a little fast, I understand that, and that's because our time together, alas, is, is short. The next thing I would do is I want to remember that this is a cylinder. Don't be intimidated by, uh, by you know, the strangeness of the tree. See the simple volumes. So I see this as a series of cylinders. So this one is a low, flat cylinder. Mary Ellen, can you push into the specific part of the drawing that you're currently working on? Like, can you get even closer so we can sort of I'll, see? I'll that. Yeah, that's, that's a little bit better. Yeah. Okay. So I'll bring that down. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna be bold and I'm gonna switch off to one of my darker pencils here. And 
I think that's probably going to help out a lot. So yeah, see that pencil does help. Thank you. See that trunk this way, and then we have another cylinder that, and I'm going to pull out a little bit and up. There we go. And another cylinder here. So see it as a series of, of cylinders that are connected together. Now, this is essential because you have to draw it as if as a three-dimensional object. So it's not flat. It really is rounded. And you're going to notice just as I'm drawing this, it it almost seems to like come to life as a 3D object right there. Now, little areas like this, you simply fill them in along those lines like that. Notice that now I'm at the stage where I can add my branches. So I know that, and I'm looking at my reference image right here. I have my one branch right here off to this side. I have another branch that is, I think I got that line a little bit wrong the first time. Yeah, it's a little flatter, but coming off this way and like this. And once again, I draw as if it's transparent and treat each branch, even the branches themselves, as little cylinders. Now, as time goes on, you may do a little bit less of this, you know, of you don't necessarily have to have all of every single one drawn out with the elliptical shapes like this. But it really helps when you're first getting started to, to grasp how those branches are moving and also to get that three-dimensionality of it. Now, here's a great example of what I mentioned to you earlier. We have this branch here, okay? And this comes off rather thickly. You'll notice there's lots of lumps and bumps in there. Don't worry about that. We're gonna get there. And we're just drawing, we're just using the big basic shapes. And when we look at this, you're gonna notice this is moving, this, this branch here, okay, is moving downward, okay, and then moving over, and this branch is continuing out this way. But notice as this tapers, okay, this plus yeah. this equals that. Mary Ellen, can you, can you move the reference photo out of the way a little bit and just zoom in on your drawing? Um, so there we go. And just hold for a second without drawing so people can see it. Sometimes I think your movement. Okay. Just give it like a second and then you can start moving it. That'd be great. Thanks. Okay. Is that good? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Super. So then what I'm going to do is once I have my tree and I'll, I'll move the there we go. We're all the way up to the top. We've got some major branches in. Okay. And I'm going to go down to the bottom here. I, oh, I see what it's doing now. Okay. Now it's focused. So now what we want to do is we're, I'm going to start to put in some of the tree roots that I see here. And I'm going to start to put in a few of the details. And once again, I'm not going to fuss putting, you know, don't fall in love too early. It's just like your mother said, you know, you, 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 you can't, you can't, uh, you can't rush these things. You have to make sure that you get all of the big basic forms in first before you fall in love and start putting in all of those little tiny details that we all adore. Now, the reason of doing that, the reason for doing this is because if you don't do that, 
you may have to, the odds of you having to make major changes in any drawing are always high. And so you want to make sure that you've got all of your proportions as you want them to be, as you like them to be. And you want to make sure that you, um, that you have it laid out exactly as you like it to be before you start to put in all of the wonderful details. And when you do this, you'll notice that I am working my way up and all around the tree as I as I go along. Mary Ellen, can you move your image uh, down a little bit? Or the, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so you, you're going to see that. Oh, and I have another branch here. I will put that in. So your drawing should always be about the same amount of finished all the way through the, the entire subject. So what do I mean by that? I, I shouldn't have all of these roots completely done, okay? And then have all of this be still all blocked in and everything like that. I don't want to have it, I wanna have the tree to be completed at the same level for each, for each uh, area. Because again, um, you wanna finish the drawing as a whole and not, as a, um, and not just have one little part that you've fallen in love with and do that. Now, I'm probably gonna have to break that rule today uh, because again, our time together is all too short. And so what I'm gonna start to do is in these, some of these areas here, I'm gonna start to put in some of the darker values that we ha that I have around this tree so you can see how I'm going to manipulate, I'm gonna take some of these stronger lines out that were construction lines. It's gonna to start to look a little more like our tree now. And one of the things that I always need to remember as an artist, just as we did with the sphere, and we were playing around with the cylinder, I'm going to remember that I have a lighted side of the tree and I'm imagining that my light is coming from the upper left hand corner here. And I'm not gonna break that rule because that's going to help me define all of the forms on this tree and to give it the look that it's three dimensional. Now, once I've blocked in, and I am working in the water soluble graphite right now, Okay, I only did my construction with the 2H pencil. And even then I'm, I'm kind of taking that all out now. Okay, you'll notice that I'm starting to put in the texture of my bark. And let me take a moment so you can see my reference photo. And you're gonna notice it has all these beautiful, wonderfully organic lines that move through its trunk. And so I'm going to try to capture those in my, in my piece here. And then I'm also going to begin to put in a little bit, there's gonna be a little cast shadow in here no matter what, so I'm gonna put that value in. Notice that I'm treating all of these, all of these roots as being, again, like little cylinders. And I'm working that texture in while I'm working in with the value. Now, I'm taking a little bit of pencil out here 
I want to sort of reinforce the shape. This looks like it has to move up just a little bit. See, that's exactly what I was talking about. That's why you don't want to fall in love too early with one little spot because you might have to move something and then all of your hard work would be, would be for naught. Mary Ellen, while you're uh, working on this, uh, could you could you speak to this idea of finishing the drawing all at the same time? Like, how would that, how might that differ if you also have leaves and flowers and things that you're incorporating into? Your I can I can actually show you an example of that. This is a tree. This is this is a a tree that I've been working on, and what you'll notice is is that. Can you zoom in a little bit so we can see? Sorry. Yeah. yeah. So you're going to notice that all of the leaves are, and you'll notice that I didn't draw individual leaves. So when you're drawing in, um, when you're drawing uh, trees that are in full leaf, please don't think that you have to sit there for a million years and and draw every little leaf. You'll notice that. I've dealt with the leaves in masses and that when you look at this, the masses are all drawn in, okay, everywhere. And now what I've started to do is from the bottom area here, I've started to put in, and this is where I wanna really create some focus here. So I've actually started putting in all of the darker values in here, okay, first, and then I'm moving my way up through the tree in order to finish the drawing as as I as uh, all along. Now that doesn't mean that some areas won't be lighter and some areas won't be darker. That's how I'm going to be able to create that illusion of space and three dimensionality. But it does mean that the that once I mass in all the leaves, I mass them in everywhere. When I put in all the roots, I finish the roots everywhere and then I go in and put in all of my finishing touches so I'm working with a full drawing all the time rather than just one single area of the drawing thank you so, sure yeah I've got some handy dandy in progress drawings here for you oh sorry started drawing and wasn't looking where I was so <laughs> so it doesn't help that it's backwards for me. That's that that always throws me. I see the mirror image for some odd reason. So there we go. So here we go. I'm going to try to finish off a lot of this trunk so that you can see how I'll approach using the watercolor with this. So, and I do want to finish off one of these lovely branches. There's also a terrific shadow right here. There's just a whole world in a tree. One of the things that's so fantastic about drawing trees, especially when you're outside and you know, if it's warm enough for you to find, if you can find a nice sunny spot, or maybe you even have a, a window at home you can sit in and draw some trees from your window. One of the things that's so fabulous about it is you start to see the little world that is this tree, uh, the, the, the birds, the squirrels, the insects, I, I uh, years ago had an amazing tree that was right next to the balcony of an apartment that I lived in and um, my cat was fascinated watching the insect life running up and down the trunk of the tree all summer long. And she was, she, she just, it was better than, than anything as far as she was concerned watching all these little bugs and creatures and things move so you'll see i'm starting to define by using the shapes of the shadows 
to begin to create form. And when you think about it, you know, you're, you're, it's like you're translating uh, a language. You're taking a three-dimensional object and you're, you're putting it on a two-dimensional piece of paper and you're trying to represent that object and the experience of that object because that's what, that's what art's about, right? We're sharing the experience of looking at something beautiful and you're, you're trying to bring that onto the page and you don't want anything lost in the translation. So now we have this, this is all blocked in bit like this. And so now in some of these areas, I'm going to begin to go in. I'm, I'm a little unhappy with this. There's something not, not gelling in here for me. So I'm going to come in here and fix this. I think this needs to be a little further over. I don't quite have that. So that there, there again was my warning about, about don't, don't, don't leap into those details because you may have to erase them. And it's a crushing blow to have to erase lots of work. It's no fun. No one likes to do it. Especially if you have that feeling that you're like, oh, I just, I, I just got that one part just the way I wanted it. And, but you're going to have to move it because something else wasn't working. There we go. Now I'm much more pleased with that. You're also going to notice the subject's going to tell you. It, you're, you're going to look at your drawing and you're going to be like, it, it doesn't look like it, or it's, it doesn't look balanced. And that's when you need to go back and really start to see what you've been doing. Marilyn, just a heads up, we have about 15 minutes left in the class. Okay, well, so, that, so that's going to show you how we've got the basics down. Now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to switch to a different drawing so that because getting these, getting an entire tree down is going to be difficult. This and Mary Ellen, as you're switching, um, can you talk to how you avoid smudges across your drawings as you're putting them together? Ah, smudges, yes. So uh, first thing is, is if you have a problem with smudges, I highly recommend that you use a piece of tracing paper to lay your hand on while you're working. Uh, please, you know, one of the things you should do too is get out of the habit of actually laying your hand. You'll notice when I was doing this, my hand is way off of the page and I'm extending the pencil out. I'm really never laying my hand on the drawing itself. If it's an unavoidable situation, I use uh, a piece of tracing paper and I'm also kind of trained myself to be in the habit of, instead of which which itching along, I, uh, I pick it up and move it and pick it up and move it. And that's how I avoid the smudging. Now, what I have, yo, oh, that's fine. Now, what I have here is the Japanese black pine. This is, and I have lots of graphite on this, and this is, um, and this is ready for me. And you'll notice that I've put in a lot of texture on this bark, and this is ready for me to start to use a little bit of that water soluble graphite on here. I'm going to go in and darken down just a few areas here. And I'm going to start with my darkest darks and also, and then move into areas that I want to have. A, a field of a middle tone. And when we mean middle tone, we're talking about, let me take this here. We're talking about middle tone. This is our darkest dark, right? Whatever our, our medium will do. And then of course we have our lightest tone over here. Our middle tone is this area in here, okay? So when we're wanting to create a middle tone, okay, that's what, that's where I move from the darkest dark to the middle tone. And remember, we try to avoid the highlights if we can. The great part with the graphite is that uh, once it dries, even uh, when, once it dries, it will erase, which is 
fantastic. So you can always pull those highlights back out. Now I'm going to get my water here, have it handy, and my, my brush. I'm going to dip that in there. And now I'm going to start just a little bit. That was a little more water than I wanted. And I'm going to begin to manipulate that, that value. Now, you're going to notice that I'm really doing what's called a, a painterly technique. I'm, you'll notice I'm paint, paint, painting with my brush. And, oh, excuse me, I realized I had my hand on there. Uh, and the reason is, is I want to capture this texture of this, of this rough hewn bark there. So I'm, I'm coming in and I really want to control. Remember, your brush is literally moving around particles of the graphite. So you can put them wherever you want them to be. And working with that very, very small tip of that brush like that and creating that. Now, in areas here where I want just a shadow, I can come in and pull that right across like that. And if you find that you have a little bit of extra on, then go to a spot, go to another spot here where you can use that graphite. And you can begin to work that, the texture of that trunk all the way down. Now, in other areas where, say, I want to have a bit of a value, a shady area, okay, where, but I'm not sure about I don't want to have anything very defined. I'll use a slightly larger brush. Okay, so let me show the example, the difference here. Okay, this brush here that I've showed you is a four. This brush is a six, a little bit bigger. Okay, and one of the things that I want to make sure is I want to make sure that there's a sense that there's a lot of needles in this one area here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, I'm gonna take this pencil and I'm gonna very, very gently shade in here, just very lightly. I'm gonna take my six brush, the larger brush here, and then I'm gonna come in and I'm. you'll notice that I'm and look at how I'm, I'm purposefully following the pattern of the needles. And Marianne, if you could uh, just like let the camera sit for a second without moving your hands or anything in frame, so see okay. if you'll focus on the, the image, we might be able to see what you're talking about. Let me bring that all the way down for you. That's a little better, thank you. Okay, and then I can also take my, the cake graphite, and in areas where I wanna create a very distinctive dark, I can paint that in, and then since it's a bit of a shadow, I'm gonna take it and pull it out like that and in those areas now so you can see I'm starting to get a lot of a lot of pop in here uh, and what creates that pop that visual pop is that 
um, is having that point of contrast, a very, very light light next to something that's very, very dark. Now, you may notice that I just picked up my pencil again, and I've decided, you know, I want to come back into this, into this area here, and I want to make the needles look a little bit thicker here. So I added a little more graphite. I'm going to come in. Add that in there. Harry Ellen, do you need to wait for the um, for it to dry before you add in more? Like if you know, it's too light or something? That's a great question. So I would recommend, yes, you want to wait until it's fairly dry before, um, and that was where I was adding in was actually a dry area. I was kind of keeping track of where I was and, uh, and, and doing that. Um, you, you do because you run the temp, you run the risk of overworking the paper in that area. Um, all of that expanding and contracting from having the paper come in can be really, really difficult. Um, and so on the paper, and so you want to give it a chance to dry and to settle. And so um, at this point, what I probably would do is I would get this area up to a certain point again, and then I would move on to a different area in, in here. And now I'm coming in because, you know, there's this little spots where all the needles gather and I'm putting in just a little bit of that graphite. It might be a little bit dark. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in with my brush. I'm going to, there we go. And I'm just going to, that was a brush. My brush was fairly dry. And I just pulled a little bit of that out. So it's not, it's darker, but not quite as bold as it was. And um, once you get the water soluble graphite wet, can you erase after that or no? Yes, you can. And but erase it only when it's completely dry. I know. Isn't that? I mean, it's like it's it's such a it's such a gift that way. It really is. Now, I will tell you that I once I get the drawing, especially to this point, I really begin to just almost just paint uh, where I'm just really, you know, I, I'm coming in with a little bit with the pencil. So for example, if I wanted to reinforce this branch right here, I'll come in with a little bit of the pencil here, a little bit here, a little bit there, and then set that aside. And then I'm going to come in with the fine brush because these are very, very fine uh, branches here. I know, come in and blend those out just like that. But if I did something here where I wanted to, I, I wanted to pull out, uh, you know, a highlight again, or I went too dark in some area, you just, you have to be patient. I would actually give it a full 24 hours to dry and then come back in with your eraser and erase. And when you do do the erasing, what I would recommend is, is that you first try it with your, with the kneaded eraser, try it with the very, very gentle gummy eraser and see if you can come in and lift out some little areas. And if it's not coming up with this, because this is your gentlest eraser, then I would say go to the pink pearl eraser and, and use that. And don't be shy. These are cheap. I very often cut these with exacto knives to get like a very very sharp edge on them and things like that so that i can go in and just get a sliver of a highlight pulled out on on my drawing as as i'm as i'm working because um you can uh you can really uh, you, you can do damage with an eraser and you want to be careful about that and so I, and so again, you can see I'm starting to move out and, and continue moving through the tree to, I did this area all in here, and now I'm going to come over and begin to work this area up in here and that way. Mary so Ellen, I think, we're coming up towards the end of class. We have to have a minute or two. No, um, I, I know I, it goes by quickly. <laughs> 
clock. I looked at the clock. I was so disappointed. Um, as you're continuing to, to, to work on this, though, do you recommend trying to stay as close to real life as possible, or do you adjust your trees a bit when you just use them as a reference? Oh, that's a great question. I'm actually going to switch off of this right now, and so I can see you, Libby. And then, hello. <laughs> um, what I do is, and also this will give me the opportunity for, for you to see like the full the full piece there. Okay. You have to I, push it much closer to your camera so we can actually see it. How is and that? Uh, not, it's okay. Oh, maybe, it's you can okay. Put, maybe you can put a picture of it on your website. I will definitely. But um, so I will say that generally with bonsai, I, I don't need to adjust anything because, as I said, it's, it's been in the hands of an expert artist who is is manipulating the plant and, and you know, and creating this living work of art um, with uh, with real trees. Uh, I do occasionally edit things to make them um, to make them look a little bit more balanced to create a, more of a composition but I usually go with what I've got and one of the things I'm really surprised about is and 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 while we just have a minute here if you don't if you don't mind Libby I would like on my website I give an example and it, if I can share it real quick um, I'm gonna share it to my thing here Okay, and when I share this, um, you're going to see this example here. Um, these are the three trees that I was drawing here. And this is the back of our theater at the school that I teach at. And you can see they don't look like much, but when you start to really get the aspect of them and their their gracefulness and i really thought they were like three kind of ballet dancers they just i i loved these branches looking like arms extending up to the sky and and this beautiful this beautiful gentle leaning that they have you know i didn't have to do too much editing it actually what i found was it was just the back of the gym that or the back of the theater that made it look ugly. So um, I think that when you're looking at these different, um, when you're looking at these, the, at your different subjects, you know, you might not have to edit as much as you think once you start putting them onto the paper um, and you start bringing out what that, that initial beauty that attracted you to the plant in the, or to the tree in the first place. Thanks, so Marianne. That answers the question. Um, that, yeah, yeah, totally answers the question. <laughs> the website that we were just looking at, is that mm -hmm. your maryellencarsley.com slash botanical art workshops website? Yeah. Okay. Are you going to update that with? Um, I will. Okay. I, I'm going to include everything that we've done today, all of the handouts and things and, and stuff. So you'll have all of that there. And I'll even show you the one that I've had in progress here. And uh, I'll show it to you as it is today. And then I promise um, as I finish it up, I will continue. I, I continued, as you know, I'm, I'm always playing with my website. So I'll continue to update it. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, people were, were, were looking for the the reference photo that you were using today. And oh, all that stuff. my apologies. So, yeah. No, okay. that's OK. So that would be fantastic. Um, yeah. So. Thank you to everyone for attending today. Thank you for uh, to Mary Ellen for her amazing and informative workshop. It was it was wonderful uh, listening to you and watching you paint. And thanks everyone for being understanding with some of the connectivity issues. Uh, but we'll make sure you have all the information on her, on Mary Ellen's website uh, to help you continue your drawing journey. And yeah, thank you so much.